Before we start, let's talk a little bit about this guy. Uh, king Gustav III of Sweden was definitely not a LARPer, he was a king, but he was a king who was very, very excited about experiential entertainment, and in fact he died as he lived, he was assassinated at a masked ball. Um, but while he was alive, he staged at his castle these uh, masked entertainments or, or pageants were technically sort of a place where he got to play the main part because of course he was the king. For instance, he could be a knight and they would build a little extra medieval castle outside of his actual castle and maybe a papier mache dragon that he could fight in the epic end scene. This isn't well documented, but there is at least one painting portraying this. I have been told I'm also not a historian, and this is probably not true, but I have been told, and I choose to believe, that it happened, that once as he pierced the dragon with his sword, its papier-mâché side, he accidentally killed one of the two poor actors inside. The lesson of this is, when you make LARP, sometimes you stab a peasant. <laughs> so, the twofold game design lesson of King Gustav III is this. One, you make the rules, but you don't get to be the king or the hero. If you want to have exciting games, then you should go to LARPs. You shouldn't make LARPs. Making LARPs is hard work. Luckily now you can do both. But remember that in your own games, you don't get to have the exciting experiences ever because nothing good will come of that. You will forget that there is a person inside the thing. Second, your job is to make your players feel safe, so that they can play, and be safe, so that they don't get hurt. LARP is not inherently dangerous, but life is dangerous. And everything I'm going to talk about under the, the, during the next hour kind of goes back to these two things. LARP has some qualities that has some effects on us, which is why we LARP, we're going to talk about that, but the world still exists. Even if we pretend that we are somewhere else, uh, there are some things that can happen, and we have to remember to, to help ourselves and our players be aware of the world around us so that they don't get hurt while they are doing things. So, the most important thing to remember is that we are animals in animal bodies, all of us. We have pretty advanced brains, but our brains have developed through evolution. That means that the, the, the survival brains, the hamster brains, which are only interested in, in survival and procreation and, and chocolate, are inside <laughs> the smart brains, which are interested in taking degrees and LARP design and things like that. And the fastest brain is the stupid brain. And that's good, actually, because that keeps us alive. But that means also that in LARP situations, very often people will act with their reflexes and not with their brain. And that this is why we need to prevent many kinds of accidents from happening even before the players get into that situation, because players are still humans, even if they perhaps are playing werebears. And they may accidentally punch someone in the face or something like that if we haven't created a system where they don't do that. The other important thing to know is that our sensory systems, our brains and our nerves, they don't actually know what fiction is. We know that some things aren't real because they're not, they don't have as high definition as the rest of our lives. When we read a book, we can see it very clearly, but we can't also smell it, except in our imagination. So we know it's fiction. And sometimes we go to the movies and see a horror film, and then we jump, that's the hamster brain, right? And then we laugh because the smart brain remembers that that wasn't actually true. Uh, but in a lot, sometimes we can create an illusion that's very, very real, and the body doesn't know that it's fiction. You know, the player always knows. The, the smart brain will never forget that it's not real, but the body will, the rest of the body, apart from the smart brain, will believe that it's real. And this is what makes LARP cool, but it also sometimes can create some situations of, of danger. So, don't make dangerous games. Don't make games that in themselves create dangerous situations. This sounds obvious, but once you start getting ideas, you know, you're gonna have like amazing ideas. Um, <laughs> Consider laws, consider the culture of the country that you're in, consider common sense. And remember that grown-ups are allowed to take risks. In our culture, in Finland, for instance, where I come from, it's completely normal to play ice hockey, which is a very brutal sport and would probably be illegal if we'd introduce it now. Um, but it's com considered completely normal. And people are allowed to go to Mount Everest and try to climb it, even though they die. People die on the mountains regularly. It's not illegal 
to make these choices as an adult. And yes, I guess we could make a Mount Everest climbing LARP if everybody involved would decide to LARP that thing together. But you, as a LARP maker, don't ever, ever get to make that choice for somebody else. All right, do you see the distinctions? The participant can make choices, but you don't ever get to make dangerous choices for anybody else. And you have to take special care with children, important if you're making educational <laughs> games for children, with non-players, that's people who just happen to be close to your LARP when it's happening, and beginners, that's people who haven't LARPed before. Now, I'm going to come back in a little while to why you have to take special care with these groups, but let's first talk a little bit about this. LARP is a form of structured play, as we just heard what Marina was talking about. And this is why we call LARPs games, even though they in some ways, and many of our LARPs are not very similar to what you normally think of if you hear, hear the word games. But when we play, we create something together, and, and when that play fun happens, I felt we already felt it on the lawn, for those of you who participated in that, uh, something magical and fun and real is created together between the players. Um, and this is why we talk about safety, so to enable that thing, because if you're worried or too shy to even participate, or if you're uncomfortable or too hungry to concentrate, then that magical automatic thing won't happen, right? So safety is the prerequisite for play. When you feel safe, then you can also play. Play doesn't have to be fun. This is important. LARPs are not always fun. But it does uh, require consent. That means, consent means that we both agree to do something. So everybody involved in the situation of play needs to all the time continue wanting to do that thing. They need to be able to choose to do it. I want to participate and I still want to do this thing. And then after a while, I'm con all of the time I'm making the choice. I'm still here, I'm still here, I'm still doing this thing. And this is the, the basis of designing safety in LARP. Uh, I put a blue star on the slide, which you may or may not be able to see behind me, because this is one of the like, most important slides. You, you're, it's okay if you forget some of the other stuff. Opting in and opting out. That's what you always have to think about. How do I design for opting in and opting out? The word opt is a little weird. It's like option. It means choice. So opting in means to actively choose to participate in something, like a LARP, or a situation inside a LARP. And to be able to choose to participate, you need to have an idea of what it is that is going to happen. Informed consent means that I have information about the thing that is going to happen, and then I choose to participate in it. If I don't have information, I can't make an informed choice. And this is a huge challenge for LARP makers. Because actually, and I mean, as Eric said, some of us have been doing this for more than 20 years, and we still can't explain what LARP feels like. We can explain what you do and what it looks like and a little bit about the idea, and then we can try to put in words what it does when it works. And we're, we can't explain it. We are so bad at this. And even pretty simple LARPs. Uh, I don't know, did you have a good experience with Family Anderson? Yeah? So it's a pretty simple LARP, but it can give a very intense uh, emo experience of drama or fun or both of those or psychological realism or just like parody all of those things can happen also sometimes in the same LARP. Um, so it's very difficult to give really really informed consent about participating in a LARP because if you haven't done it before and even if you have it's very difficult to predict what it's going to be like. So this of course is why non-players who just happen to walk in on the thing and beginners and children are especially, like you have to take a special care with them because they really can't have an idea of what's going to happen, right? So they really, if they say, yes, I want to do it, that is not worth very much in itself because they don't know what they have just promised to do. If you cannot communicate with 100% clarity the kinds of experiences your participants will have, and you can't, then opting into the LARP itself is not enough. You also need ways to opt out of the LARP or the situation. So opting out is the opposite of opting in, uh, choosing not to participate in something that is about to start or is already happening. Having the possibility to not participate in something requires to be able to see it coming. So again, information is quite important. If you say that we're going to be at a cuddly LARP about Care Bears and then the Were Bears suddenly attack, 
Okay, this was a bad example. So if one of us, for instance, would have like a mortal terror of werebears, we might feel that it was unfair that this surprise was sprung at us in this manner. I can think of a better example later, you can ask me in the cafe. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you do need to have some idea what's happening, or when something's starting and you're like, whoa, I want no part of this as a player, then you need to have a mechanism to, to leave. So not participating uh, is all kinds of things, like the possibility to steer the direction of the gameplay, what's happening inside the fiction, and or to cut the gameplay, that's to step out of the, of the playing of the fiction, or and to leave the game in the middle. It's good to have a way to do that. Also for other reasons, sometimes people just need to go to the bathroom real bad or, you know, <laughs> it's good if the game doesn't break if that happens. And you need to be able to do this without fear of social punishment. And actually this part of it is what's a little bit difficult to design for. So when you're a child and you're playing with someone, you can be like, this isn't fun anymore, and then you can leave. And that's actually kind of okay, right? But again, LARPs aren't always fun. So what, do question, do you, what question do you ask yourself? I think a better question is, is this meaningful to me? What I'm experiencing right now, it, maybe it feels super hard, but does it still feel meaningful? And if, if the answer is no, it's not meaningful. Now I'm just in a terrible situation and I, as the player, I'm getting nothing out of this and this is torture to me then I think you should leave. And, and if I feel that, then your job as the LARP maker, as the game designer, as the person running the game, your job is to give me the opportunity to do that without being humiliated. I might be afraid to step out of play uh, because I think the other players might get angry or disappointed with me. You know, when you're LARPing, you don't know what the others are thinking. Maybe they are also having a terrible experience secretly, but they're just continuing to LARP, right? Um, Maybe I don't want to have a whole conversation about why I need to go, because it might be something personal, so I don't want to draw attention to myself. Maybe you need a discreet way to leave your LARP and so on. So your job as a LARP maker is not only to make the LARP, but also to design the social space between the players, the humans who are participating in the LARP, so that they feel safe in saying, this is fun and this is not fun, this is meaningful and this is not meaningful. And of course, especially with educational games where the participants are often forced to play by, by their teacher or something like that, making this safe space is not an easy task. You're going to solve it in different good ways, but it, you have to think about this stuff. Uh, now I realize I didn't look at the time when I started. When did I start? I have uh, 46 minutes left. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So this week, think about this stuff, all of this stuff that I'm speaking about now. Mm -hmm during the LARPs uh, that you play. When you play, or when you have played, you can think back, did I know how to opt out of the LARP or the situation? Were there special methods for this in the LARP that I played? Was the method workshopped? That means, did we practice before using this method? Or was I just told, you can totally do this thing? If they say, you can leave at any time, the door is there, it's no problem, then you probably don't need to practice it. But if they say, to leave this, leave this LARP, you need to dance a special dance, and it's really complicated, and you don't get to leave unless you have done it the right way, <laughs> then that's a bad method, by the way. But also, then you should probably practice it before. And one thing is, have you already opted out today? You don't need to raise your hand, but think about that. I, I thought of it when Christopher, before even the first talk, Christopher said, I have a game that we can play for those who would like to play a game right now. And then he pointed at the lawn, and then some people went there and played, and some people opted out. Some people thought, well, I'm one of the people who does not want to play a game right now, so I'm going to sit right here. See what he did there? He, there was some social pressure. I was like, oh, I should probably go, like, everybody's going. No, I don't want to go, I'm going to stay. That's okay. He designed that sentence, because that's, that's an instruction, like an instruction is a rule that you give to the participants. Christopher designed that sentence to, I'm not even sure he did it on purpose, but probably because he's very good at this, to give you the opportunity to stay behind, and some of us did. Yeah. The more information we have, the easier it is to make a choice. If he said, we're going to play flamingos and penguins, which is a game that I love, I would have been like, yes, I'm in. But since I didn't know, I didn't want to take the risk. All right, let's talk a little bit about role playing. Um, you've seen already some definitions of LARPing. I'm just going to throw another one in that I like. I made it up myself, that's why I like it. <laughs> role playing is characters acting, that's performing actions, in fictional situations, that's situations that are not real in the real world, with interesting emotions, interesting emotions, I made a little list, love, boredom, 
anger, fear, shame. When I feel shame in my real life, I hate it. But when my character feels shame in a fictional situation, that's actually super interesting. Um, and the interesting information, the interesting thing about the interesting emotions in, in the LARP is that the emotions that you feel in a LARP are not fictional in a way, because my emotions are generated by the body. So my body is still is making the character's emotions. So those are real, but the consequences are not real. So my character can be ashamed, but I don't have to deal with the consequences because they're not actually real. You see, that's actually what makes LARP powerful. And the, the fictional social relationships, family, status, comradeship, trust, loyalty, sisterhood, being colleagues at, the, at an office or something like that. Um, the role play contract is a little piece of role playing theory from the 90s, which was a huge breakthrough when, when somebody wrote this down, Tony Sifan wrote this down in Finland. Um, he said, do you know what, to be able to role play with each other in any kind of role playing, what we do is we make a, a promise, we don't say it out loud, but we make a secret promise that we're not going to judge each other based on what the character does. We're not going to judge the character based on the player, and we're not going to base the judge the player based on the character. So even if I'm a crazy murderer or, or the evil family member in Anderson, after the game, you're not going to treat me like I'm actually an evil family member, because we agree that it's not true. And this was actually a really important mental breakthrough. Then, of course, the next important mental breakthrough became like 10, 15 years later, when we realized that, of course, this isn't actually true. We kind of pretend that we have this agreement, and to a point, we have it. So this, the role-play contract is true. We actively try to not do this, and we do not, in the social, we don't actively judge each other based on, on experiences inside and outside the lives, right? But of course, emotions and experiences travel inside, into the LARP and out of the LARPs. I, as a hu I'm still, it's still the human body. I am still the same person, still in the same body as my character. So all of my real world experiences are coming with me into the LARP. And then sometimes I use them in the LARP and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I, I do it on purpose and sometimes I do it by accident. So social punishment for LARPing is, of course, not good and absolutely forbidden. But feeling the feelings that are wrong for the situation, that's completely normal and, and inevitable. In some ways, we always uh, will do it, right? So when these emotions travel, when the player's emotions travel into the game, uh, or when experiences from the game travel out of the, the game as emotions between humans, we call this bleed. And we call this both when it's a positive experience when it's ne and, and a negative experience. Sometimes maybe we play that we're friends or we play that we're the family Anderson and we don't even like each other very much. But after the game, we kind of weirdly like each other because it's my family. And I don't even know these people. I mean, I, so, but that's actually real. That's positive bleed, right? Or it could be a negative thing as well. Bleed is not harmful, but it is unpredictable. And often when, when we're thinking about, when people react very strongly to LARPs, handling bleed uh, is a part of that, and we're going to talk about bleed as a design tool later in the week also. It's good to know that players have a strong emotional reaction to all LARPs, and it's completely unpredictable which players have, which, have strong reactions to which LARPs. So if, you, if I would make an educational game about torture, and it would be ser very serious, and it would have this strong theme. Of course, I would want people to have strong reactions, um, and I would probably prepare for people to have very strong negative reactions, because it's a terrible thing to consider, torture. It's a, it's a terrible thing. It's about something that's terrible, actually, in actual fact. Um, but it's just as possible that you play the family Anderson, and one of the players suddenly becomes really deeply sad because the game made them think about their dad who has a conflict with his family, or like something like that, unrelated to the plotline even. But it can just activate some memory, and then they become sad, and maybe they even have to stop playing. It's completely normal. But it's also unpredictable. That doesn't say that there's anything wrong with the LARP. It's still a very good LARP, and that, that's the kind of thing that just sometimes happens. Um, and you probably can't stop that. But it's good to be aware that that might happen very rarely, but it sometimes will, like during your career as a LARP maker, sometimes your players will have a com what seems to you as an unreasonable reaction. Uh, and, and then you need to know how to act in that situation. Many kinds of LARPs are designed on purpose to produce strong emotions. So again, especially when you're making games for grown-ups who choose to participate, you don't need to protect them from these emotions. That would be stupid. But you need to uh, acknowledge them, 
and reflect upon them. And if you make a game about a strong theme, like, say, torture, it might be impossible for you to make a game where nobody has a bad reaction. It might be that the cost of making a powerful game is that somebody, some one of the players is going to hate you forever. That might happen. Then you have to think about it, is it worthwhile? If you're doing it for a good reason, if you're making this game to teach something important about society and the players are making an active choice to participate, it might be worth it, even if they might think you're a bit of a dick. If you're making it because you want to make your cool game and you're so awesome and you have this great idea and if some people get hurt in the process, too bad, then that is a bad idea and you shouldn't do it. And also you should probably not be making LARPs. <laughs> um, the best way to learn about how this stuff that I'm talking about now works is actually to pay attention to, to your own emotions when you LARP. Um, and here, during this week, of course, we can help each other. So after the LARPs, it's good if you talk about the LARPs to your, to your co-players and be like, oh, I felt this feeling and I felt this feeling. And then you can compare uh, because people do react very differently, not just depending on what the, happen, what's happening to their character, but also who they are. Um, being players and being players in an aware way makes us better designers. How did I feel? Why did it feel different to us? And when did I feel wrong? Like we're playing this comedy game, but I was just sad all the time. That is interesting. Was there something in the design that is flawed in the sense that that generates that? Everybody who plays that character finds it difficult to be in the comedy when everybody else is like, ha ha ha. Or is it something that has to do with the player? These are analytical game design skills. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning sadness is that it's good to know that the most common emotional reaction to a LARP, any LARP, Nordic and, well, sorry? Nordic especially. Nordic especially, but, but I would say any LARP, yes, is sadness. Even like a really happy LARP, possibly even Care Bears, Wear Bears, which is a very trivial LARP, of course. Uh, I think the reasons, there are many reasons for this, and it can, it can look quite scary. If you haven't seen it before and somebody's like, oh, after the game, you're like, are you okay? Good to start with that. And they're like, no, I'm fine, I had a great time. <laughs> So let's think a little bit about what's going on there. Typically, it's one of these things. You are sad because during the LARP, especially if it was a long game, you were inside a fictional community. You had fictional relationships, but those relationships were real for the duration of the game. And all of these people had these lives, and, and they were happy and sad and funny and boring, and all of that stuff was going on with them. And now they don't exist anymore because the LARP is over. It felt really real, and it's not there. I was in all of these relationships, and they're gone forever because the LARP is over. And some people react to this at some, in some LARPs with sadness. For me, it's like every 20 games I play or something like that. Suddenly, I have this reaction. Other times, not. It's very weird. I can't predict at all when it happens, but that's it. Uh, if uh, me or a player is in their real life in a bad situation, they're really unhappy, for instance, or very lonely or very stressed at work, and then they go to a LARP where they're in a good situation and they get to do meaningful tasks and kill the emperor or whatever it is, grow a tree or make a marriage or something, and it's a wonderful experience. Then when that, when that society disappears, then I'm suddenly reminded that my real life is maybe not I mean, I'm very lonely compared to this moment. A moment ago, I wasn't lonely. Then my real situation becomes very clear. Again, the problem is not the LARP. The problem is that in my life, I may be very lonely. And it's not your fault as a designer. It's just good to be aware that this can happen, but pe because people get perspective on their life when they uh, step out of their, their own life for a little while. Another thing that can happen is empathy sadness. So if you make an educational game about something that is wrong in the world, the, the players typically get to experience in some way what is wrong, this thing that is wrong. And when they step out of the game, they can be ashamed and angry and disappointed and rageful at the world that this thing is going on. Torture exists and it's terrible and I'm so angry and sad and I, I feel powerless, I have to cry. This you can actually help by saying, well, there are some things you can do, here are some organizations you can join, or what can we, you can talk together about what can we do to make the world better. Right? Uh, and then, yeah, perspective on your life. Sometimes you come home from a big LARP and you're like, I hate my job, and my husband is a terrible person, and I'm going to divorce you, and I'm going to change my job and get another education. I, my recommendation would be take a few weeks before you make, make the choice. 
<laughs> but it might be true. I mean, you could also go on a vacation or go interrailing or something, and you would come home and have the exact same reaction from the perspective, right? It's not the LARP that does it, it's the life that does it. Okay. Um, yeah, before and after the game. I'm going to have to introduce a concept now. Uh, there's something we call the magic circle. And the magic circle is the time and space of a LARP when we play the characters. We, the the runtime is another world, word for this. But quite often, I don't know how you, how you did it in the cabin, but probably, probably you did something to say, well, we're going to start the game, we're going to be quiet and count to ten or something, and then we start the game and then we are our character. So maybe you say, when you enter the room, you are the character or something like that. And then you have some way of signaling when the game ends and where the game ends. I don't know, for instance, when you played Anderson, if you said, if you go to the bathroom or if you leave the building, you're no longer in the game. That could be a rule. Sometimes it's said out loud, sometimes it's not, but that's the magic circle is here I am President Wonderhorse and here I am Johanna Kolinen. Hmm? So, the LARP that we design as LARP makers is not just the runtime, that's the, the thing that's happening while we're playing the characters. Uh, it consists of the following, the preparation work, that the players make together to be able to play the game, the runtime, and also the after stuff. And then the, uh, the final end of the after stuff is actually a little blurry, but typically you can say when the players leave you, when they are no longer with you in the place of the game, then probably the game could be said to be over, or the LARP can be said to be over. So I'm just going to run through this real fast just to give some idea, because a lot of the design stuff that we're talking about isn't actually, con is, it, it doesn't go very deeply into these things, but this is still part of the process that you have to think about when you make a LARP. So before the LARP, basically what needs to happen is that you make your players feel welcome, and you make them feel secure in the place, so they know what's where, and where are the bathrooms, you know, and where's water. Uh, they need to feel secure with you. If you're really stressed and not on top of things, don't go, oh my god, I don't know what I'm doing, be like, hi. Welcome, please sit down, I will be with you in a minute and go panic somewhere else so that you don't scare them. Uh, and feel secure with the LARP. Uh, and then you need, before the runtime starts, before you step into the play, you need to help them learn or invent together everything that they need to know to be able to play the LARP. Who, well, who are the characters? What is the world? How do we interact? What are we wearing? All of those things. Need, that, of course, needs to, they need to get this information somehow. And you could, for instance, tell them one by one in very many words, like I'm doing now, that would be a bad design. Or you can write it all down. That's a good design sometimes, unless it's super much information, because then it might take them four hours to read and you never get to play. This is something you need to actively design. OK, around the playing, having a clear border around the magic circle is very useful, both for game design purposes, but also for this kind of mental distance to what's going on in the fiction. Maybe you want to play a special song at the beginning and the end of the game. You can maybe build a gate or have a special door that people enter and exit the fiction through. You can make a little ritual like closing your eyes and counting, counting down, or you can put on a character's clothes, or you can have a special item, and, when you have that, and then at the end of the game everybody ritually takes off their special item. It doesn't matter what it is, but it's nice to have some kind of clear border around the magic circle. And after the LARP, all kinds of things happened. And just think about this during the week. Um, first, the game ends, immediate reactions. Usually they sound like this. And then, and then, that's usually immediate reactions, but it can also be like, and you need to go away and be quiet and think about what just happened. That could also be an immediate reaction. Leaving the character behind or de-rolling happens. Sometimes it's an active process or sometimes you just do it like this. Uh, debriefing, personal reactions, you talk about how you experience the game, um, reflecting on the theme, of the theme of the game and learning. If you make an educational game, designing this part is super important because all the studies and experience say that the experience is sort of you're, you're making the garden and then you are harvesting the fruits of learning in the reflection phase. First you experience something and then when you reflect on it together, together that's when the real learning happens of what, what, what did this mean, what did we just learn. Uh, and that's also when the individual experience, because of course you LARP from a, we call it the first person position. I am the audience but I, my audience is sitting on a chair inside my body like this while the LARP is going on. And that means that all of us, of course, have different experiences of the LARP. So after the LARP, we talk to each other and we somehow find some kind of common idea of what this LARP was. Different player will have different needs 
at different times after the game has ended. If you play a small game, it's not a big deal. But if you make a huge, deep game with big emotions or big learning, you have to think about this a little bit because how to, to enable for people to get what they need while you get them to reflect on the thing that you're trying to teach them. And it's a good thing to ask players to talk to players that they have had intense play with, uh, just to make sure that they remind each other that they are not actually the person that they were inside the fiction. A really good rule that you can take with you just now during the week is uh, this, the third person rule. We LARP in the first person. I am President Wonder Horse and my partner is Super Stallion. And then when you stop and you step outside of the magic circle, I'm sorry, in this LARP now, that's the magic circle, you can be like, so, I thought, now I can't remember what it said on the slide, I thought that, uh, no, no, President Wonder Horse uh, was really excited about the plan, and then I thought, as a player, that it would be interesting if he got increasingly paranoid about Super Stallion maybe having a plot to overthrow the government. You see, you make a distinction between what you, the choices you make as a character and the experiences that you are, the choices you make as a player and the experiences of your character inside the fiction. You're going to make mistakes and say I when you mean the character, that's okay. Just try to remind yourself because it, it gives you a good perspective. Um, yes. Uh, if you make a big LARP, we're going to hear some presentations of big LARPs. Uh, we're talking about many players for long periods of time and expending intense experiences. One really good thing to do after the LARP is to have some kind of social. Another good reason to have some kind of social gathering after a LARP is that you just experience like an exciting story of some kind. Uh, nobody else in the world will care. Like you'll go home and you're going to try and tell your sister about this story. She doesn't care. The only people who care about what happened at Family Anderson are A, the people you played Family Anderson with, and possibly B, but not as much as you think the other people who are playing Family Anderson, because they only care about their story. <laughs> so actually, it's also socially really nice to just have somebody to talk to about how much fun or how interesting it was or how wrong it went or something like that. Um, but if you think that this is a in, in, very intense game, a good thing to set up uh, could be something called a LARP buddy. You, you, you introduce the players to each other and pair them off and say, OK, a week from now, you're going to call you, and you're going to call you, and then, and then you just talk about the LARP. It doesn't have to be a big thing, just do a little Skype and just talk about the LARP and see how you feel. That's something that, that you can do, and it can be quite nice. Some people totally don't need it, but some people find it really useful. And at the end of the LARP, if it's a big thing and it's a big experience, the players will say, we have to meet! Let's have a meet up next week and also a month from now, and, and it feels very important at the time. And then you do it, and then a week later or a month later, actually the players don't really need it anymore. But it's still nice to meet, because then they can talk about the LARP, because again, nobody else cares. <laughs> yes. So how do I act with myself, as myself with people who only know me as my character and vice versa? That is a little bit hard, and actually one thing that I would recommend is to make sure that the players get to know each other a little bit socially before the game starts. Because it's easier to return to a pre-existing relationship that has been strengthened by the experience of the LARP than to start with like, I have been married to you for four hours and I love you very much, what's your name again? <laughs> yeah. the, the, it's a little bit of a threshold to do that thing. Okay, physical safety. Um, I'm gonna do this really fast because most of these things are really obvious. I just wanna say, you know, I just want that it has been said here. Of course, this doesn't matter so much if you make a LARP in a cabin and it doesn't involve weapons, right? So, 
creature comforts, eating, sleeping, bathroom, players who don't have access to these things or players who are too cold or too thirsty won't be able to play in a satisfactory manner. If you are Norwegian and you're making a winter LARP in Norway, it will be obvious to you what to wear, not to die. If you invite players from Palestine or even France or even Lithuania or even southern Finland, they might actually die. So, <laughs> so you just, because wherever you are, there are things that you take for granted. When I was, when I grew up in Finland, one of the things that everybody knows is that when there's snow on the ground, you don't drink outside, or if you do, don't do it alone, because very soon you're going to want to lie down on the snow and rest a little bit, and that is how you die. But foreigners, you have to tell them this. They're like, oh, I'm just going to sit down and chill out a little bit. No. A, either you will get urinary tract infection, which is terrible, or B, you might fall asleep and die. And your players may be from all kinds of places. It's obvious to you, it's not obvious to them. If you make a summer warp in Palestine, same thing. They think they know about like having enough water. They don't. <laughs> they, in this case, being everybody from not the Middle East. Uh, prepare your player. Oh yeah, it says wolves and bears. So there are LARP areas in Norway that have wolves and bears. Uh, it's fine. We don't usually get eaten by wolves and bears, but it's <laughs> but it's good to know what happens if you meet what what to do if you meet a bear. Um, violence, action, alcohol, any of these kinds of elements in LARPs, which might you might design a LARP that involves all of this, and that could be very exciting. And by action here, I mean like fighting and things like that. That could be a thing. Uh, but of course, that's going to that's gonna enhance the chance of risk, right? And diseases, actually, the, the most damage we get from LARPs typically is that we sleep too little and don't wash our hands very much, so we all get the same flu, or we drink from the same cup and we just share germs. Just have basic awareness of hygiene and make sure there's a soap by the toilets. These kinds of things are actually, your, your players will never notice, but they will notice if they get some kind of stomach flu, all of them. And then we call it something we call world overlap, which is that real traffic, you have a fictional space, and then somebody has a road through it, and a real car will emerge, and your players, if they're not paying attention, or if they're for some stupid reason sleeping in the road, they might get run over by this car, so make sure that doesn't happen. Now, of course, you're saying, well, what if we can't make games that involve violence and cold and, and alcohol and starvation? Then we can't make any fun games. Are you here to kill all the fun in LARPing? No. Physical pressure is a valid design tool that you can choose to use. Uh, things that, like being hungry or dirty or being uncomfortable, like it could be, like you make a game where everybody has to stand on one leg for the whole duration of the game. I don't know why you would do that, but you could totally do that. And then you would use the discomfort of that that increases over time as a design tool. That's fine. But it's good to remember that slight pressure can simulate strong pressure. If you're a little hungry, it's easy to play that you're very hungry. If you're very hungry, you can't play at all. And it must be an active choice by players and organizers. And if you have, and this goes back actually to you think you, people know everything that's inside your mind and they don't. Uh, there's a Finnish game called Luminescence. Uh, that was played in a room with 2,000 kilos of flour, which is meal. That's the thing you, you, you bake bread from. Uh, 1,000 kilos? 800. 800 kilos. There's inflation in this story. 800 kilos of flour, which is the thing that you bake bread from, on the floor. And it said in the instructions, if you have asthma, you cannot play this game. I have asthma, so I have not played this game. I was very upset that I couldn't play the game. Um, it was the scenography, it was supposed to be a hospital, it was abstract, it's a thing. Um, but I, I couldn't play the game because the flower in the air would have possibly killed me. And I am very happy they told me, and I'm very happy that they thought of, of, um, of telling me. Another way of killing me is to invite me to a LARP where you only serve hazelnuts as food. <laughs> Tell people. Another way of killing me, because I'm weak and not from Norway, is to make a LARP that happens on an icy cliffside. If you make unexpected design choices, please tell your players. So, sometimes you and your players will decide that you're going to make the most awesome, physically intense game ever, and you're not going to have any opt-out mechanisms because you think that would be a cool design. It's not a cool design. Don't do it. Sometimes you and your players will agree that you're going to design like a really strong physical pressure, psychological pressure game, and you're going to have opt-out mechanisms, so it's going to be totally okay. There are all kinds of ways to leave this game. 
it's probably still not a great idea, actually. If you're just doing it to see how far you can push the players, it's probably a bad design. You, you need to think about why am I doing this? What is the purpose of this? Uh, if you think, oh, I want to push the LARP form, talk to some people about when they tried to push the LARP form and, and how many people got hurt, and then evaluate whether that direction is something that we should continue pursuing. Probably not. Um, the way we often simulate danger uh, is like violence, um, but also other things like physical intimacy, like kissing or having sex or something like that. The characters may want to do that, but the players don't want to do that. And you can also just decide that this kind of thing doesn't happen in the game. That's a completely valid way of doing it. But if you want those kinds of actions to be performed by characters in your fiction, you need to think about how do the players do this. This, of course, also has to do if you want to do supernatural events. If your characters can fly and your players maybe can't fly, then you need to think about how to do that. What if they want to be invisible? What if they want to do magic with fire? Um, then we typically have simulation systems, different systems of representation uh, to, to, make, to be able to do that without it being very dangerous, for instance, without hanging from the ceiling ourselves like this. But sometimes the simulation methods that we, we use actually introduce other dangers. So if you use explosives to make fire magic, for instance, then, then that's dangerous in other ways, and you have to be aware of that also. And remember again that creature reflexes are there. Adrenaline is real. If you really scare your players, they will be scared. The characters are scared and they are also scared. And they're, they're not going to be supernatural. So <laughs> they're not going to be very not sort of rational, sorry, in their, in their uh, behavior. Uh, yeah, so one question is what can you do? If these kinds of things are happening in your LARP, put organizers there and have eyes on the fight. I think that's a good rule of thumb. Always, always eyes on the fight. If conflict is happening, in case something goes wrong, that at least there's somebody who isn't involved in the situation, who can see it from the outside uh, and break if, if it's needed. Too much player enthusiasm is an interesting challenge. So in-game escalation is another term for this. Sometimes, very often, in your LARP, you may have a very good uh, interaction system for the players to be able to do things. They have decided how to interact and how to do violence and all of these things. But then the story is so exciting and they are so in character that they very, very gradually and sneakily, or all at once, but the, most often sneakily, they escalate. They become, the, the playing becomes more intense and it was only slightly physical and it becomes super physical. And then suddenly, when, towards the end, when the zombies are attacking up the stairs, the players defending the upper floor decide to throw an actual couch at the zombies. Real example. <laughs> that was not a good idea. Nobody got hurt, nobody died, but they could have. I don't think anybody has actually died in this way, actually ever, at a LARP uh, from anything like this. Um, but it, you know, it really is just a question of time, I'm sorry to say. So, so I mean, statistically speaking, sooner or later, you, somebody could slip on a, you know, just on the floor and, and, and die. That also happens. Um, so, but don't, you don't want to be, be the cause of that. So you want to ask yourself, does your game design or the way you prepare the players give them this sort of a cultish excitement? You may want that for other reasons, but does that also increase the risk of them escalating the intensity of play out of your control? And during the game, how, what do you do to, to prevent it, to control it, and to correct it? Yes. So, the most dangerous thing in LARP is the following, lack of sleep. If you have a, a LARP that is very long, or here, where maybe people don't get too much sleep because you're also interesting and you need to talk to each other, and then you play a LARP in, on like day four in the afternoon, and you've had just a little bit too, too little to sleep all the, you know, just a little bit too few hours of sleep leading up to this point, it impairs judgment, it impairs concentration, it impairs cognitive skills, it can create hallucinatory states, then you're very tired. It's not going to happen this week. But it, you know, if you stop sleeping entirely, it does that. Uh, it takes very long to recover from, which makes you sad for a long time after the game. And it makes people emotional and sad. So actually, the best way you can protect yourself from players breaking themselves in your game or breaking your game because they're being stupid is make sure that they sleep at night. Now, everything that we have spoken about so far 
social safety, emotional safety, physical safety requires being able to step out of play. So how do you step out of play? Okay, just think about how this is designed. One is that you have to make the magic circle, the way you, whatever way you have designed it, um, easy to cross out of. And you also have to make the fiction of the game easy to step out of as needed while remaining inside the game. I'm sorry this slide says the game would be easier to clearer if it's a LARP. So, so there are different things. I have to be able to leave the, the play situation, go outside. But I, it's also really good if I can, while we're playing here, I'm playing here with Martin and la la la, he's standing right here, not over there, and we're LARPing very much, and I need to check something with him. It's good to have some kind of tool to just check in with him while we're playing without having to leave the room, because it could create a weird situation in the LARP, or it's stupid if it takes one second. It's silly if we both have to like walk away from the LARP, ask the one second question, walk back and continue. It's not very smooth, it's, that would be a disruptive technique. So what can we do? And actually why we do this, this is important not just to allow opting out of parts of the game, like, ooh, this type of content I'm not interested in, I want to choose not to participate, that's of course part of it, but also that you can get suddenly ill, or maybe there's a phone call from a player's family and there's an emergency and they have to go, or something like that, or maybe they won't need to go and play with some other tools that are also present in the game, they may need to step into a black box and play a flashback scene, or they may be playing vampires, but the player needs to go to the bathroom, but vampires don't pee, so how do you solve that? For all of these different kinds of reasons, you need methods to be able to step out of play. You're going to ex explore some of them during this week in, uh, in the games, but I'll just put in some uh, that we're probably actually not going to use this week, just because they're super useful for different <laughs> things. This is uh, a 90s classic an emergency rule called the hold rule. Um, if you have a big LARP over a big physical area with maybe hundreds of players and you need a method to stop play, it's the same as this, except this requires that you see people. It works like this, I yell hold and freeze, and then you all yell hold and freeze. Let's try it. Hold! Hold! And then if some people over there hear you hear yelling hold, they also yell hold and freeze and so on. And then You've told them this before. If you hear hold, you look around, am I in danger? No. Is somebody else that I can see in danger? No. Then you wait around because it means that somebody somewhere else was in danger. Danger over, then somebody says game continues or LARP continues. And then you say LARP continues and then we continue to play. Very good for actual physical emergencies. Somebody breaks their leg or something like that. Okay, off game rule. You, you can have some kind of word, for instance, off game, that you say off game. I just want to check that you're okay. And then the other person can be like, no, I'm, I'm totally fine, la, la, la. Or you can be like, off game, I'm not sure I want to do this thing, can you help me? Do you think that this will happen? Or something like, whatever you need to check. Or like, off game, is it okay if I, if I push you a little bit? And then they can be like, yeah. And that's a good way of doing escalation, by the way. Not always, not if it's against the rules of, of the LARP, but it could be a good way. Hmm? Ping pong rule for checking in casually with the other players. Same thing, if checking if the other person is okay, but even more sneaky. I'm playing with Martin very intensely, I'm like, ping? Because he's sitting there crying, oh, it's terrible! And I'm like, oh, he's very convincing. I don't know if he's actually role-playing or having some kind of breakdown. Then I can be like, ping? And he's like, pong, ping, pong. And he's like, pong. <laughs> then I know, okay, he's role-playing. Of course, if he's crying, I mean, his body is maybe still crying, so then maybe he says, PONG! <laughs> still, it's still okay. Uh, if something real has happened, if there's been a real emergency, and the person has become completely passive, but not fainted, there is, this method actually has a grey area, which is that if the other person is in a state of shock, but they know this rule, if I ask them PING, they might be able to say PONG, even if they are totally not okay. I've never seen this happen, but it's good to know that this is a theoretical possibility. So if you have a game where, where there are re in-game reasons for a lot of people to be looking like they're completely catatonic, for instance, that's a design that means that if somebody actually is looking catatonic, it's going to be a little bit hard to, to find them. Do you see what I mean? Uh, and then you, for that kind of a question, if you want to make a game like that, you want to make sure that your players can ask a better question, a question that cannot be answered with one word, so if they get worried, they can say, off game, can you describe how you're feeling? And then if the person still just says, pong, then you, then you pause the game and get them to a doctor as fast as possible. Do you see what I mean? 
Yes. Uh, many LARP have an off-game room, it's just a room where no play is not going on, where you can step outside and maybe have a cup of coffee, speak to the other players or something. Many games use something called the cut-break rule, uh, where you cut to pause the game and step out of the fiction. Everybody cuts a little bit like hold, but only locally. Uh, and break means slowing down or changing direction of the play. Like we're playing. We're playing a bullying scene. Maybe I've been bullied in school. Maybe I just think bullying is really boring and I don't want to play these topics. Uh, and then I say to Martin, break, if we, if we have agreed that that is, and if we have practiced before, then he'll know, okay, he's going to play, he's going to back off a little bit and give me some kind of so possibility inside the fiction to leave the situation, right? He'll be like, you're not worth it anyway, and turn his back on me, and then I'll, I can leave the situation without pausing the play. Um, uh, tapping out, same thing, uh, without words. We're playing the bullying scene and we have decided that in this game we use the tap out rule, I can just do this on him, double tap on the arm or on the head or wherever I can reach, or even on myself if I don't see that, if they're not within reach, they know I've, that's the, that, this is the same thing, it means back off. Um, or you could use that to mean cut, uh, but it's been, typically it's been used for, for pausing, for, for um, lowering the intensity of the game. I just want to recap this. Sometimes players don't want to pause the game or step out of the situation for reasons such as imagined or actual peer pressure, presumed expectations, they think it will disturb the other players, they're curious about what's going to happen next in the story, but they really don't want to be there themselves, but they're curious, but they, you know, that thing can happen. Um, and the network of fictional relationships can be very strong. None of these reasons are a good reason to not pause the game. And, and if you make big, long, intense games where this could be an issue, uh, you kind of have to think about how to communicate to your players that it's always okay to, to opt out if you need to opt out. And the reason we know that most of those aren't even true is that you think while you're LARPing, you're like, if I take a break now, or if I go and rest now, or if I opt out of this situation, everything will be ruined. It really won't be ruined, because after the fact, our brains edit all of that stuff out. You can have a game that has a break, like every five minutes something happens, or you switch characters or something. That's completely normal in many LARPs. And your brain organizes it into a story after the fact, and that whole part when the ambulance came, and that whole other part where, where you had a break to eat food outside of the fiction and outside of character, you don't even remember that. You only remember the fictional part. So. Enabling opting out, finally, ask yourself these questions. Is it necessary for the fiction that all characters are present in all situations? Is it physically possible to leave the game space? Have you workshopped whatever opting out rules that you're using? That means have you practiced them before the game? And what is the social cost of pausing the fiction for the player or for others? And if the answer of any of the first question is no, then you probably haven't enabled the players to opt out. And if the answer, and, and the answer to the last uh, uh, question should probably be almost zero. If you, can make it plus, if you can make it positive so that it's a cool thing to be able to pause, that would be the best, but we haven't achieved that yet, I don't think. Yes. And as I said, in educational LARPing, especially in school settings, students are often forced to participate. So how do you create a situation where you don't make them force them to participate in something that they're not comfortable with, is the question. Most usually this won't be a problem, because what's going to happen is they're just going to not role play, or they're going to sabotage your game, or they're going to call you an idiot, or they, they have many methods of not participating, especially if they have some kind of status in the room. But if they are weak in the room, it might be a difficult thing for them. So you need to be aware of this when you design the game. Oh, that, my timing is outstanding. I'm very, very surprised. Okay. <laughs> Now, maybe some of you are like, yeah, yeah, but we heard about mazes and monsters and, and suicides from all playing games, and now I'm starting to think maybe that's a thing. I'm happy to report that that is not a thing. There are zero documented cases of LARP causing mental health problems in players. I have a little bracket there that says possibly one, because I once heard from a person who claimed to have met the person who worked with someone who had, had triggered uh, a mental health, a previously unexisting mental health episode during a LARP. It's a very weak case. I don't call that documented, but I'm going to try and follow it up. So let's say that it's zero. During 30 plus years of role-playing history, 
role playing, as far as we can tell, has never actually caused any kind of, of mental health problems. However, strong experiences of any kind, any kind, ice hockey or a divorce or a lot, um, could at least potentially trigger mental unhealth with people who are who are uh, already not well and who are on the sort of verge, on the tipping point of becoming actively ill. I, I guess that's true, and that's uh, especially connected to physical stress. Um, I, for instance, come from a family with a lot of, uh, of, of mental health problems, and I know that one of the biggest things there is lack of sleep and eating irreg on irregular hours and so on. Uh, so, so it's good to have, as a player, I think it's good to have an awareness that if you need sleep, like again, this is another very good reason also actually for you as an organizer to say, if everybody just sleeps a little more, we're going to have less uh, problems. But ultimately, of course, if you don't know how your players are, they could also be secretly ill with some other kind of disease, and that's also not your responsibility, actually. Uh, but you need to be able to enable them to play, especially if they ask for your support to be able to play. Be attentive off-game to how people are feeling in the game. And if you're friends with somebody who has mental health, health issues, maybe, you know, telling them, suggesting that they don't, not play when they're ill is a good idea. Uh, positive effects of LARPing on mental health issues could also be strong. Nobody knows. It's completely undocumented. LARPs, however, do seem to or trigger mental health situations, primarily depression and exhaustion problems in LARP organizers. <laughs> this is very well documented. So it's not so much the role playing, but once you get into this, you can become hooked on organizing LARPs. You, it's going to be little culture projects, they might be poorly funded, you're going to be super passionate about it, you're going to do it but while you're also maintaining your normal job or your studies and you don't have time and you work too much and, and you're so ambitious and you want everything to be perfect in your wonderful LARP and then you work yourself really tired and then that breaks you and your finances. Don't do that. We need you. Don't break yourself. Um, yeah. Uh, so then I had the two questions, one minute observations. Um, so community safety is one. I would like now for all of you to just look around in the room. This here is one of your LARP communities. You may also have a local LARP community that may be the, the people who are LARPing in your geographical area or in your local club or so on. This is also now a LARP community. Is LARP well known in your environment? Is it understood by people who are not LARPers? And how are your actions affecting this? It's a good thing to think about. Uh, we live in the age of the internet. You need to think about, do pictures or will pictures from this LARP ever go online? If, if you don't have a very good reason to put pictures on the internet, um, a good idea is to not show pictures of, of players e ever as a default, but you need to agree about this with a player. Um, and there are reasons why this is important. Uh, if LARP is not respected, uh, it can affect things like funding, but also things like if you're somebody's living with a partner who is not a LARPer, they might not respect the reason to take a week to go to the summer school, for instance, or something like that. Uh, so, so there are many reasons why we think the impact of LARP, we all need to take a little bit of care of how we present LARP to the outside, outside world. So if you want to make a LARP where people in like, I don't know, like I guess Nazi uniforms would feed actual humans to tigers, Again, don't do it, but at least if you do it, like, don't make a big press release about it. Um, <laughs> don't do it, I think, it's a better role. Yeah. So different places have different tolerances for play as well. If you want to make a game that's played in the street and you have toy guns, I would maybe say don't do it in the United States or Tel Aviv. And in like Helsinki, you're fine if they don't look too realistic and you're not too close to the American embassy. <laughs> based on real experience. <laughs> so, and my last point is organizer safety. And actually this is the, the final point, it's connected to what I said about mental health in organizers. Uh, we need to start thinking as a community and as LARP organizers about this. What if I am the problem? What if I make a LARP and I'm the problem? Uh, we need to think about how to keep our players safe and how to keep ourselves safe. And and this is mostly about not working yourself to death so that you can be present and attentive 
and cheerful and patient while you are running your game, if you're running it yourself, and to have as much support on site as you will. And if you're already in a place where you are organizing a lot of LARPs, I would like to talk to you about this later in an informal setting, but it's just something I would like to add. There we are. Uh, the good resource for the existing knowledge uh, of things relating to the Nordic LARP tradition is nordiclarp.org. You can find everything there except this talk, which you can find on the summer school homepage. That's right. Thank you very much.